What's up, guys? It's Larry, the mortgage guy, your mortgage insider. And today we're going to be discussing uh, first time home buyer uh, tips, but I take a deep dive. So I would do like a first time uh, webinar, but I kind of gloss over the details uh, because, of course, you can't talk about everything that needs to be heard or learned about in an hour, right? Uh, so the purpose of these classes is to break down my, my webinar that I do in an hour and get really deep on the details involving each particular de uh, topic of the first time home buyer experience. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Let's see here. All right. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always put them in the chat. Uh, you can join the Zoom. I actually put the link in the description. What's up, David? Thank you for uh, saying, uh, saying hello. Um, but yes, if you have a question, you can always put it in the chat and I will address it, uh, or do my best to address it while we're on the call. Uh, or you can join the Zoom, the link I actually put inside the chat. Okay. So uh, again, we're going to address uh some details about the first time home buyer webinar now specifically we're going to talk about interest rates because that's like the hot topic right now everyone's asking what are the interest rates today or you know uh are rates going to go up or whatever it is that they're 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 wondering about right so i'm, I'm going to go ahead and address that today okay um Again, uh, my name is Larry Lee. I'm a certified veteran mortgage advisor and branch manager of the Larry Lee team. I'm a licensed loan officer since 2016. My side hustle is a social media marketing coach and running my own ad agency, Robots LLC. The reason why I bring that up is because I, uh, how do I put this? Uh, I want to marry the two passions. You know, the fact that I, I'm really into social media and, uh, you know, I believe I'm an expert at it. Uh, at least I'm a professional at it. And I want to marry that with uh, the mortgage industry because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of misinformation and I'm trying to uh, provide good information and I'm going to use social media to distribute that information. And you're kind of part of that experience by being on this call. Okay. Uh, my mission is, my name is Larry Lee. I'm a, I love the mortgage business, but I was fed up with the lack of education and information clients were provided during their application process. So I created a first time home buyer coaching class for mortgage clients that provides instant access to answers to questions and simple explanations to the mortgage process and how to qualify. What I mean by that is I give people the ability to access the information they would get from a loan officer, but online without having to talk to a loan officer. Cause I know some people don't want to engage to, with a loan officer just yet because they're not, they're not committed yet. They're not ready yet. So, uh, you know, loan officers are salespeople. So they're afraid to engage with loan officers to ask these questions. So I want to make it so that you don't have to talk to a loan officer and get the same kind of information. So that's my goal of doing what I do right now. Uh, I also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching for those who want it, but of course, you have to engage with me in order for me to provide that, meaning you can't be anonymous uh, if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching. But of course, I provide provide that to anyone. It doesn't matter. Unlike other loan officers, I mean, my passion to coach first-time home buyer home buyers on the mortgage process. And that makes all the difference of how I have helped hundreds of people get on the right path to home ownership with many of them becoming homeowners. You remind me of many of my smart successful and savvy clients who are now homeowners because you are talking to the you're taking the right step on the home purchasing process like they did and what i mean by that is you're part of this call you're doing research right the home buying process is very confusing to most people but that's why i am here to simplify this process and make sure you're 100 percent prepared in the home buying process and to become ahead of the competition and what i mean by that is i want to of course inform you of what the process looks like what you need to do in order to succeed in the process but i also as a loan officer, I can provide you uh, some competitive advantages. Like I can fully underwrite you before you even get a contract. That way you can close faster. Uh, you're confident. You can basically say, I'm already done. Uh, so this offers as good as cash uh, because my part of the underwriting process, my part of the qualification process is already taken care of. Okay. So that's a, a competitive advantage I can provide for you guys in this crazy market. Okay, uh, my wife, uh, my wife and my kids, of course, specifically Hunter and Bruce, who are pictures below, because they are on the spectrum for autism. They're nonverbal, and my goal is to provide them uh, the opportunity to get ABA therapy. I've been told by many parents that I trust, who have children on the spectrum, uh, who have told me that this was a game changer. Right. So my goal is to um, to have enough resources this year to provide them. Uh, therapy, right? Uh, my second why is, of course, veterans. And the reason why I have a, a sort of a, 
I guess, affinity towards helping veterans is because of this particular reason, okay? My father was living in Da Nang, Vietnam during the fall of Saigon. My mother lived in Saigon. My father left by helicopter, my mother by boat. It was U.S. soldiers who helped them get in the helicopter and on that boat. They met in Hong Kong, China. If it wasn't for a U.S. soldier, my parents may not have survived, met, and had me. And I wouldn't have what I have today. I might not even exist. Uh, so those, those U.S. soldiers are more than likely veterans now. So thank you, vets. I owe you my life. And I really do feel I owe a debt of gratitude to all veterans in general because they're just men and women following orders. They don't know that they're actually saving lives and creating families and futures. Like the people who helped my mom and dad, they had no idea that they were creating the opportunity for me to be born. And then for the opportunity for my children to be born, right? If it wasn't for the help, I wouldn't exist. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, again, I talk about the first time home buyer webinar. Uh, I talk about the honest answers to top 10 home buyer questions. And then I also uh, address uh, questions that loan officers should ask before taking an application and the top five things not to do when, when buying a home. I'm not going to go over all that today. Uh, there's just no time, but uh, I'm going to uh, at least... Um, you know, addressed one of the things which I think is probably the most asked question when it comes to uh, when it comes to the home buying process, which is uh, you know what's the interest rate, right? That's the question that most people like to ask, right? So I just want to make sure there's no questions. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Bruce is one of my attendees on the call, and he asked the question, but he. He is not right there right now. I'm gonna wait for him to come back before I answer his question. But he asked, um, you know, is there a resource online that he can use as a real estate agent to provide estimations on interest rates or estimations on how interest rates impact the payment uh, for particular houses? Meaning, if you look at a hundred thousand dollar house, a two hundred thousand dollar house, a three hundred three hundred thousand dollar house, what would the payment be? And then you know, can he maybe uh, put different types of interest rates to see how that would affect the payment and such? So uh, I do have an answer for that, uh, but I'm going to wait for him to come back before I answer that question. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move on with the, the, the class that I already have planned out. Right. So uh, disclaimer, I'm not trying to piss anyone off uh, or make anyone feel stupid. I'm simply trying to provide transparency because most loan officers are doing a horrible job of telling the truth. Also, any information I share is general knowledge I acquired through training and experience. Very Every situation is subject to a case-by-case -case basis, and exceptions are always possible, especially with different lenders and financial institutions and states. Basically, what I'm saying is that uh, what I say might not be the case for every lender. Every lender has different expectations and guidelines and overlays. So, uh, and also states have different laws as well. So uh, please uh, understand that as I go over this information. Okay. All right. Let's see. Here. All right. In questions, again, these are all the questions most people ask. And a lot of people ask, what is the interest rate, right? Which is number nine. Okay. And I'm going to actually go to my class that I created just uh, about that particular question. Where is it? Let's see here. I have a lot of classes as you can see. And this is what uh, most people ask, right? Is what is the interest rate? Now, before I really get deep into it, I want to tell you what I tell my first time home buyers during a webinar. Okay. Um, it's possible to quote a rate, right? So that means if someone calls me and asks me for a rate quote, it is possible to quote a rate. Right. But I needed some details before I do that. Right. I need to be able to look at their credit scores or get a credit score from them. And normally the credit scores are incorrect if they never applied through a lender, meaning they're going through Credit Karma 
or they got their experience score, transunion score from their bank. Normally that score is not the score that we're going to use, but it gives us some sort of semblance or an idea of where they might be. Uh, we also want to know how much you're trying to purchase, how much you plan to put down, how much basically loan to value. You know, are you borrowing 95%? Are you borrowing 90%? Are you borrowing 80%? Meaning you're putting 20% down, right? Zip code helps. Uh, we might want to know your debt to income ratio, but it might not be a factor. But the truth of the matter is it's not reliable because people are trying to give the best case scenario. That means if you were to ask me what's what is the interest rate, I'm going to act like you are a perfect buyer buying, you know, with 20% down and everything's good. And I'm going to give you the best rate based on that. But we know most people don't land in that part of the spectrum. Most people land kind of in the middle. So the rate that I give you is going to be incorrect, 100%. Right. Okay. 99.9% .9 is going to be incorrect. Just so you know. Right. So basically you're already setting yourself up for failure. When you ask a loan officer, what's the interest rate? 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is not going to be accurate. Okay. That's basically what I'm telling you. Okay. And you know, the math, it could be less, it might be 80%, it might be 50%, but it, there's a strong chance that it's not going to be what you're, you're actually going to get. Okay. What's most likely going to happen if you ask someone, a loan officer for an interest rate is the quotes can be inaccurate and sometimes they purposely quote a lower rate with fine print like yeah this is this is the interest rate which is the 15 year if you clocked in 15 days right well 15 days 30 days 45 days they all have different pricing right so that makes a difference rates change daily sometimes multiple times a day right what i'm talking about is like the rates today in the morning might be different from rates in the afternoon right? Uh, and really it's for marketing purposes, right? They, they want to uh, advertise the best rates. Like Bruce earlier was talking about how uh, he would see rates that are being published online by some online lender. And he even said uh, that, I mean, how do we know if, if that's even true? Because there's so many different variables involved in quoting someone a rate. I mean, it's literally useless. And that's the truth. It's, I mean, they're going to advertise the best rates, right? Uh, and people can misquote uh, and they're not like, and they're not liable for it. Right. So like, let's say you tell me, you know, uh, I have a, this much credit score, so much I'm putting out, whatever. And I tell you, well, your interest rate is going to be this much. And then the next day you want to go forward with me and the rates go up. There's nothing, th there's nothing that you can hold against me for that. Cause I could be like, well, the rates, the, the, the market changed, the rates went up. Right. So a quote is not even uh, a commitment in any way, sort of form. Like, it's not like when you're buying cars. When you buy cars, like, how much can you sell the car for $20,000? Okay, I'm going to go over here and see if they can sell it for $20,000. Okay, you can't. Okay, hey, I'm coming back to you because you have the best price. For the most part, they'll honor that pricing because it's it's a static environment. There's no there's nothing affecting the pricing of the car. I mean, there's a few things that could, but every day, for the most part, it's going to be the same price. Rates, it's impossible. I mean, I've, I've seen one time where the rates were exactly the same. Uh, in terms of pricing like that. And that was a freak of nature. It's always different every single time I see it. And I know this because I'll be sending rate quotes every single day to individuals who are thinking about refinancing or whatever, and the numbers are always different, okay? And I can, again, I can misquote you. I can misquote the rate and it doesn't matter because I'd be like, well, why did the rates go up? Because it's the market and you can't hold it against me, okay? Uh, they also possibly added discount points to look lower. What I mean by that is maybe the rate is a four and a half, but they tell you four, but there's a discount behind it. I mean, you got to buy it down, but they didn't disclose that to you because it's over the phone. They don't have an application. They don't even know who you are. You don't even know who they are. I can tell you whatever I want, really. You know what I'm saying? I can be like, yeah, the rates are in the threes. And you're like, really? I'm like, yeah, you know, let's take an opportunity to see what happens. I'm like, oh, by the way, it, it was the threes, but you're actually in the three and a half. But if you were to buy down, a couple thousand dollars, we can get you in the threes, right? I mean, that's literally how things can happen. That's why I say it's the most likely scenario. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how to get an accurate rate quote uh, next. But before I do that, Bruce had a question that uh, was a great question, right? And I'm going to try to paraphrase it, Bruce, but I don't want to mess it up. So if I'm if I say it correct incorrectly, you can always jump in. Uh, but he asked, uh, "Is there a resource online?" Uh, actually, you know, if, if you want, you can go ahead and ask it, Bruce, and I'll repeat it after you ask it. Well, if the topic, you know, if if I wanted to discuss discuss with a potential buyer mm -hmm. the, the interest rate and how it affects monthly payments of principal and interest, I was wondering if, uh, if somehow or another an agent like myself can get a hold of a of a matrix 
um, that basically has on one of the axes or one of the, on one side the various interest rates. You know, three, three and a quarter, three and a half, three and three quarters, four, four and a half, four and a quarter, so forth. And then how much at those interest rates, um, uh, what the monthly principal and interest payments would be um, mm -hmm. for, for every $100,000 borrowed. And that way I, I, I felt as, a, as an agent, I could extrapolate if, it, if, um, if the buyer were looking to purchase a $300,000 house, well, uh, the principal and interest payments would be for, that particular, for a particular interest rate. Uh, the principal and interest payments per month would be three times what they are for a hundred thousand dollars borrowed. Um, so that that's basically the question. You know, that's it, it's, it's really basic information that would help me discuss more intelligently interest rates and principal and interest payments uh, with a potential buyer. Right, and I think that's a great question. Okay. Um, so the first overarching answer, uh, and you know, you might not like this answer, is you're not allowed to quote rates at all, right? Just like I can't quote a rate in a state I'm not licensed in. So like, let's say uh, I'm talking to a client in Alaska. I'm not licensed in Alaska. So I'm not allowed to even talk about rates to someone in Alaska about, uh, about Alaskan interest rate. In, in fact, I can't quote them any rates. I mean, maybe if they ask what are the rates in Texas, I can tell them the rates in Texas because maybe they're thinking about buying in Texas. But I can't Larry, be like, yeah. Larry, uh, yeah, I'm not really talking. Uh, I'm not referring to quoting rates. I'm just, I'm just. This is purely mathematical. Um, yes, yes. At such yes. and such an interest rate, um, and I'm not quoting anything. I'm not quoting an interest rate. But at at any one of these interest rates, this would be the principal and interest payment per month for every $100,000 borrowed. That's really not quoting anything. No, I totally get it. I totally understand. I'm just kind of uh, segueing to the next part of the, 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 the question, the part that you actually, you're interested in, right? Um, so you, the, the recommendation is for you to just call your lender and just ask them, hey, what are the rates looking at for a 20% down convention or whatever, right? And just have them tell you. Right. And then you could use that as sort of a, uh, a starting point when you actually talk to your clients. OK. Um, and even if you're not quoting rates, the fact that you're talking about rates, you're kind of in the gray area. You see what I'm saying? So really, you got to you got to almost focus on the fact that, listen, I'm not quoting you a rate. I'm literally just telling you what your your payments would be if it was this rate. So this is all theory. I don't know what the rates are today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, well, that, I heard. That's the idea I had in the back of my mind. Yes. I mean, I, I can't, I can't uh, be as knowledgeable as a mortgage broker in being able, you know, to, to discuss all the subtleties involved with, with borrowing money for a home purchase. But it, right. this is purely mathematical, you know. Yes. Um, and it has nothing to actually. It has nothing to do with mortgages. Well, it does, but not really. <laughs> What's the mathematical relationship between interest rates? and amortized uh, principal and interest payments per month for every $100,000 borrowed. Right, right. Um, and uh, give me one second here. <clears throat> uh, there, there's an answer to that question, right? And I don't, again, I want to give you the best information possible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to literally just give you step by step on what you can do. Okay. Uh, I'm actually pulling up a website to show you. Because that request, the answer to your question is this: there is a website, there is a, a resource, there is a um, uh, something you can go, you can access, and not just you, anyone, right? Anyone can access this. Uh, I am, like I said, I'm looking for right now. Let's see here, but again. You you have to like literally outline it to the people. Hey, I'm not quoting you rates. I don't know what the rates are. I talked to Larry, right, my lender buddy, and he said that the rates were in this area. But if you want an actual quote, you're gonna have to talk to Larry or whoever lender they choose to talk to. Right, you have to talk to a lender. Right, uh, but I heard 
that they're in the neighborhood of this, right? Like they're kind of in the in in the fours and the fives, whatever it is you want to say, right? Um, but you, you you have to preface the conversation that way you're not being accused of quoting race because again you're not allowed to do that, right? Um, and, I, and I'm not saying you as a real estate agent, I'm saying you as an unlicensed for that state because even I can quote a rate, in, like I said, in Alaska. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So. I'm going to share my screen here. Actually, my screen's already shared here. And I'm going to show you real quickly what you can provide uh, for yourself and your clients when it comes to uh, using the numbers, right? And trying to figure out what to do. So uh, on my website here, you're going to see free tools and you have a payment calculator right here. Okay. You click payment calculator and you can plug in really whatever numbers you want. Right. So you can put the property value, the down payment, how much the mortgage is, what rate you want to test out at this, in this case is 5%, right? But whatever rate you want to test out and, and the amortization period, I mean, all these different details and it'll actually tell you what to expect in terms of numbers. Right. So let, let's play with it. That, why, why does down payment have anything to do with principal and interest payments, uh, monthly principal and interest payments. It's a risk factor. I mean, it, they, they may, it, the down payment may affect the interest rate, but mm -hmm. once the rent interest rate is established, um, principal interest uh, monthly payments uh, are, are fixed or set by the interest rate, no? And, the yeah, money well, and of course the money borrowed. <laughs> Well, it's just allowing the person, you know, because you, you, it's just allowing the person who's playing with the calculator to see what the payments would be if I, they put 10% down instead of 5% instead of 20%. It's just that's the purpose behind that being there. But yeah, if that number is not going to change, then just put it wherever you want to be. Right. Right. But, okay. But, but really, yes, the rate doesn't get affected by that. But once you, because you're not trying to quote a rate, you just want to know how much the loan is. Right. Again, it just allows the person to just play with the math because that is a very legitimate question. Uh, what are my payments if I put 5% now? What are my payments if I put 20% now? What are my payments if I put 50% now? Right. So this calculator allows you to do that. Okay. Yeah. So the let, amount let, down just affects the amount borrowed, correct? For a particular value home market. Right. Uh, well, the amount down affects how much you, you're borrowing. Yes. But I mean, if you don't even care about, you just want to care about the mortgage payment, then you don't even have to think about the, these two parts. You see what I'm saying? Right, gotcha. But it just helps you with the math because it actually, I think it actually plugs it in automatically for you, right? Like if I put like 400,000 here, that's it for me right away. So it just helps you with that calculation at least, Yeah. Gotcha. you know? So let's play with the scenario. Like, uh, how much? How much are you thinking? Let's say, let's pretend you're talking to a client right now. What, what What do you think they would ask you? Like, uh, the payment for how much of a house or whatever? You want to give me some ex uh, examples? Um, well, you know, take um, four hundred thousand dollar home, twenty mm -hmm. percent down, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the uh, what's it, eighty thousand dollars down, twenty percent of four four hundred thousand, eighty percent, eighty thousand. Yeah, so they're back. Yeah, three hundred twenty thousand dollar mortgage amount at mm -hmm. well, all right, five percent. Yep. And let's say they're making uh, monthly payments, right? And let's pretend there's no PMI because they're putting twenty percent now, right? Right. Uh, so they're telling us that it's gonna it's gonna be about twelve hundred eighty eight dollars and thirty seven cents principal interest. Taxes are just whatever. I mean, that's something you got to plug in yourself. I mean, we don't know, right? Sure. Uh, homeowners, ownership, same thing. We don't know, right? But they're going to give you an estimate based on that. But really, what you should focus on is this principal and interest, mm -hmm. because then then you just add, you know, okay, well, monthly taxes are going to be probably two hundred, so add two hundred to that. And homeowners insurance is going to be about a hundred, so going to add a hundred, so that's fifteen hundred, right? But yeah, this literally just gives you everything. It tells you like uh, what the expenses are for the for the purchase, how much interest you're going to be paying. Uh, how much of it is principal? How much do you total tax insurance you be paying? Uh, so your total payments after 30 years is going to be this much. And it actually tells you like the amortization schedule here. Mm -hmm. Larry, can right? I call that up on my my uh, uh, phone? Yep. That that calculator. Yes this this website of mine is designed to be mobile friendly. Yes. Uh, it's not live yet. It'll be live soon. But once it's live, I'll give it to you. 
but because uh, I'm still working on it, right? But I'm showing this to you because I actually designed this website so that I can have this particular calculator because I know people are asking, just like you are, they're asking, how do I figure this out? How do I know how much down will affect this payment and that payment? And should I go 15 year, 30 year? This answers your question. And mm -hmm. there's no, it didn't make you opt in, right? I had another more calculator that made you put your name, 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 number, and email. And, you know, that that's cool. Okay, for me, but for people who don't want to put their information in, they're not going to use it. Whereas it, you literally had access to it right away. Like, like I, I didn't have to put my name or email or anything like that to get this. Because my goal, again, is to provide data and information without having to opt in, without having to, to engage with me. So anyone on the planet can go to this website once it's live and do this, and I'll never know about it. So, yeah, I'll make sure that you get access to this, Bruce, uh, whenever it's it's live, Okay. Okay, thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. Of course, no problem. Uh, so, ho hopefully, that answers your question and gives you uh, some some thought uh, behind what you can do. Right? Uh, let's go back here. And before I go on to the next part of the class, someone asked: With interest rates going up, do you see the demand of investors going down? And first time homebuyers come back in. So, uh, I'm going to try to answer this question with just sheer memory and experience and based on what I have seen and what I have read, okay? Interest rates are going up across the board, whether you're buying primary or investment or second home. But recently, there has been, uh, I don't even want to call it a mandate, there's just been an update or notice that they're going to add on more fees or costs on second homes or homes that are not owner occupied. Owner non owner non owner occupied basically means it's not at your primary, right? So basically anything, second home, investment home, mixed between the two, whatever, right? If it's not your primary, there's going to be an additional fee on top of that period. So imagine the rate that it's already at, which is higher, they're adding more on top of that. And that's already enacted, right? Like it was announced like earlier this year, like I think in January, maybe February, and it's already been put into place. It was like sometime in April. I think, like I said, it might be like today. I don't know. But they said that any loans that are not locked before this date will be subject to this new pricing. So my perspective as to why that's happening is they are trying to curb curb the investors from purchasing homes uh you know i guess using a mortgage product right uh, the reason why i bring that up because there was a time i think in 2021 i'm pretty sure it's 2021 where there was another additional expense or whatever for investment properties or whatever and the way they did it was they actually uh, forced lenders. When I say lenders, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about people who are lending money to borrowers to buy houses, right? They actually had a requirement that a certain percentage of your loans could not, uh, how do I, it's better to explain this. You had a maximum amount of a percentage of what could be owner occupied and non owner occupied. Right. So they're saying that out of a hundred percent of your loans, a certain percentage is allowed for not owner occupied. Anything beyond that, you're going to have to charge for, or you're going to get, you know, some sort of penalty or whatever. I, I totally forgot everything that happened because I mean, the, the, the laws and the expectations change almost like weekly, sometimes daily. So all the information that comes to my head is like in and out. Right. Because once, once we understand it, we are impl implementing it. But then once we start implementing on a high level, it disappears, right? So I don't even remember the exact details, but I remember it was structured so that every lender was subject to a certain percentage of what they're allowed in terms of non-owner occupied homes. Anything beyond that, there was some sort of, again, penalty or whatever. I, I forgot what it was, right? So, I, and I know they're doing that to curb the amount of loans that are being produced for non-owner occupied properties because of course for the most part they're riskier okay so i i look at this 
thing that this, they created, this correction, whatever you want to call it, as an attempt to do the same thing. They're trying to curb non-owner occupied borrowing, right? So to answer your question, the domain of investor is going to go down, not because of the interest rate going up. That can be a driving factor, but I believe the fact that they're adding this additional fee or whatever you want to call it, pricing. I, again, I don't have the term. I don't have it in front of me. And maybe I'll put it in the comments or whatever when I do find it. Um, I've actually sent emails to investors about it. So I know I have it in my uh, possession as in terms of content information. But they enacted this and if that's what's going to curb non-owner occupied borrowing. When I say non-owner occupied, I'm talking about investments and second homes, vacation homes, whatever, right? So you're not even making money off of these homes and you're getting charged more for it, right? I've lost deals because of it. I've actually had clients who had to adjust what they're doing because of it, right? So it's a thing, okay? So the answer is, it's not just interest rates, but yes, the current industry is trying to curb the demand for investors. Doesn't stop cash buyers, of course, right? Which I think a large majority of investors are cash buyers, right? So it doesn't stop them. It actually, I think it might fuel them. I think it actually might encourage them. They're like, holy crap, they're trying to lock down on investments in, in second prop, second homes or owner not owner non-owner occupied homes. So we better buy up as much as possible before there's other things they're trying to create to stop us. Right. So I think it might actually fuel the purchases at least now. Right. But yes, they're going to definitely slow down the borrowing for non on non-owner occupied uh, properties because of the extra costs, which some people don't want to pay. And so you just cannot pay. Right. So, um, the second part of your question was, you know, the first time home buyer is coming back in. I, I think it will help a little bit, but I don't know if it's going to be an impact enough for me to be like, yes, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if it's a big enough impact for me, for me to be like making, uh, making announcements. Hey, first time home buyers, you guys are going to be good because they're trying to slow down investors borrowing. Right. I, I don't know if there's enough there to really make that announcement. I think the lack of uh, inventory is always going to still be there. And again, we still have the cash buyer investors who are, you know, I mean, obviously they're annoying. I mean, they're annoying to me because I get nothing out of it. <laughs> right. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and sorry, I don't know your name because it says Facebook user, as you can see on the screen. So I don't know your name, but hopefully that answers your question. Right. Well, Larry, uh, who, Im who, Im who imposes that fine on mortgage brokers for um, exceeding the minimum number of um, uh, non-owner occupied mortgages. You said that, 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 you know, if you exceeded as a mortgage broker, uh, you exceeded a particular um, a lender limit, then you would be fine. Who imposes the fine? Uh, this is a curiosity question. No, no, I'm, I'm glad you asked. It's a, good, it's a great question, actually. It's a great qu question. Uh, and I'm going to make my life easier and just find you the information and show it to you. Right? I mean, that's okay. I'm just curious. But then here's the other question. Are mortgage brokers uh, compelled then? That, what you're basically saying, as I, if I hear it correctly, is that there's a certain percentage of non-owner occupied mortgages mortgages that you as a mortgage agent can issue, okay, um, that are not subject to being fined. Am I correct that far? Then I'll ask the question. In other words, you, what I hear you saying is that if you exceed a certain lending limit uh, for uh, non-occupied homes, then and only then will you be fine for the excess number of loans that you issue to non-owner occupied buyers. Yes. So again, I, well, again, I, I want to, I want to backtrack just to make sure I don't remember all the details. So I don't know if it's a fine. 
I don't know if it's a penalty. I don't know if it's uh we won't approve this loan or we won't buy this loan. You know what I'm saying? So, so I don't know what it was, but there was, there was again, cause it changes all the time. Right. So it might be like Fannie and Freddie or whatever. And in, in this case, it's the F H F a, the F- federal housing financial agency. They're the ones that are creating these uh, policies, I guess you would call it. Right. So that's the question you asked first, who is doing it? It's the federal housing financial agency. Right. So again, I don't want to misquote or misinform whatever. I don't know if it's a fine or if it's a fee. Uh, it might be, we won't buy the loans. Like it's almost like, okay, you have 7% loans that are non-owner occupied. We're only willing to buy 5% of them. So you're stuck with 2% of those loans. You know what I'm saying? That that might be the, the danger or the, penalty or the negative or whatever you want to call it right um so again so i don't the, want what's the rationale for if that's the case what's the ra- i mean that plus the fact that if if um the mortgage broker is not gonna incur any fees for a certain portion of the loans that he issues the second home and uh, second home loans why is the mortgage broker compelled to charge a higher, a more, you pass the, those fees, which they may, the mortgage broker may not be experiencing the fees the way you're describing it. Why, why would he be compelled to pass it along to the uh, second home buyer? Because it's not, it's not being compelled. It's a, it's a mandate. It's a regulation. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's the FHA, F, it's the FHFA charging yeah. the fee. So, so if, if they cut off buying the loans, then I mean the mortgage broker doesn't incur any penalty. They just can't. They're not going to issue any more loans. So why are they compelled to 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 pass along some kind of charge to the second home buyer? It, it's just, it's an adjustment. It's an adjustment, right? So here, let me let me show you. I'm going to show you the the first. Uh, I guess correction or whatever you want to call it that happened that I was referring to uh, earlier, right? Uh, it was, let me see here. Let's see if I can. Communications. Okay. So this is what they said. Due to FHFA recent regulation change, which was in March 10, 2021, so this was last year, literally a year ago, we'll be implementing we'll be implementing new adjusters on the non-owner occupied properties, including investors and second homes. Effective with loans locked 421, 21, and after, there will be a roughly 200 basis points. That's two percent adjustment applied to investment properties and roughly 50 basis points adjustment applied to second home transactions. These adjusters can change daily slash weekly as agencies adjust their pricing for these products. Again, daily. It ch- things change daily. Okay. In the later in a letter dated January 14th, FHFA and the Treasury Department together announced that lenders are only permitted to sell 7% of their closed volume that is not owner occupied properties to the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, right? March 10, 2021, Fannie may release the above link letter, and that's these things here, right? So to answer your question, they're not they're they're basically just trying to slow it down, right? So how do they slow it down by charging more? That's basically what they're doing, right? They're 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 the 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 FHFA is uh, is basically uh creating some sort of additional fee or additional cost that's being paid by the borrower, right? Well, actually they're charging to us and then we have to adjust because of course we can't take the hit, right? So we yeah, have to adjust, like, okay, well, they're charging us more, so we got to charge you more. You know what I'm saying? So that's basically what's happening. So it's supposed to slow it down, right? So uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of lenders who probably were above that. They're probably at 10%. And they're like, okay, we need to slow this down because we can't sell it. Because what happens uh, whenever a lender and then when I say, um, brokers is a different story. Okay. Brokers, they don't even have the money. Brokers are the middleman to other lenders. Right. So let's just talk about the lenders. The lenders are stuck with these loans because the whole purpose of being a lender is to lend the money out so that someone can buy the home, get the, the loan. Right. 
and then package it with a bunch of other loans and then sell it off to the agency, the secondary secondary market, Fannie, Freddie, whatever, right? So that we can get our profit, but also recoup the money that we invested to lend money to the loan. If you can't sell it, your money's tied up in that loan. So you can't go and do more loans. You see what I'm saying? So that's that's what's happening. That's that's what compels uh, lenders to charge more because we need to slow this down because right now we have like, you know, 500 loans we can't sell. We can't sell it to the secondary market because we're above the threshold. So we need to slow things down so that we can get to the point where we're at 7% and then we can start selling our loans to the agency so we get our money back so we go do more loans because the money's tied up whether it's a secondary department I mean, whether it's a, a second home or or an investment home or it's a primary well if i have my loans tied up in second homes or uh investment homes or not occupied homes i can't lend to the primary people you know what i'm saying so it's a it's 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 a, a matter of having the supply that you can give in terms of money being tied up because you can't get, you can't flip it. That's basically what's happening. And that's basically the best way to describe the mortgage business. We're flipping loans, right? We do a loan, right? We do it ourselves. Like, so we're, we're boots on the ground. We're, we're physically creating the loan. And once the loan's created, we flip it to Fannie and Freddie, right? And they make money off of the servicing. They make money off of the eventual payments of interest that they get then for the next 30 years or whatever. You see what I'm saying? So we got like a lump sum, for the loan and you know Fannie and Freddie's gonna be like okay well you know what this loan is worth five thousand dollars so I'm gonna give you five thousand dollars for this loan and then you give us the loan we give them the loan and they can make twenty thousand thirty thousand forty thousand whatever it is they make on the interest on the back end for the next thirty years you see what I'm saying so what FHFA is saying well you can't do that right now because you're above seven percent you can't sell any more second home so you basically you're stuck you have your money tied up you invested money into this flip Right, you must money this flip, and you can't go profit off of it because we're only willing to buy seven houses, and you got ten. That's basically what happened, right? So we're like, okay, you know what? We're not going to do any more any more secondary or non occupied non owner occupied flips. We're going to charge more. So if someone does do it, we we can somehow benefit from it or whatever, or we can cover the cost of it. But we're just going to stop doing them until we can catch up. That's basically what happens. It's it's supposed to just slow down the process, right? Because well, let's 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 be honest here. There's a lot of investors that are getting into the business. There's a lot of investors that are trying to buy up these houses, right? I mean, as real estate agents, we probably see that all the time. This is the market's way of trying to stop that or slow that down, right? If that's if they, if they think they, there's a benefit behind, it. I don't know, right? But that's that's the market's way of because uh, well, let's put it this way: as lenders, we're like we don't care. We don't care who 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 loans through us. If I get nothing but investors, I don't care. I'm still gonna make money off of it. So of course I'm gonna help investors. Wait a minute, hold on. You're gonna charge me, or you're not, you're not gonna buy my loans? Okay, you know what? I'm no longer interested in helping investors. I'm not as excited anymore, right? Or I'm going to help you, Mister Investor, but unfortunately it's gonna cost you two percent more. Oh, you don't want you don't want to do that anymore. You don't want to do you don't want to invest? Okay, well, I don't blame you. You know what I'm saying? That's basically what's happening. You know, it's just the way of the, you know, the FHFA trying to correct the imbalance, I guess, is the way they look at it, right? And again, you know, investor homes, I think, are, are more, there's some more risk behind it. That's why they ask you for more down payment, right? Like, if you really want to wrap your mind around why does it cost more to buy a house as a secondary or not owner occupied home versus, uh, versus a primary, why are you charging me? 10% down or 20, not charging, requiring 10% down or 20% down on an, on a second home or investment home versus a 3% down on a conventional home ready loan or 3.5% down on FHA or 5% down on a normal conventional. Why, why are you do that? It's because you're a higher risk, sir. The fact that you're buying a house to make money off of it, the fact that you're buying a house that you may live in once in a while, there's no guarantee that you're going to fight tooth and nail to protect that house. Whereas if you're living in it, you have your kids in it, your car is there, your storage is there, your clothes are there. You basically take a bath and use the restroom there every single day. You're going to fight tooth and nail to, to make those payments. So there's a higher risk for people who are buying houses. They're not really 
not really uh, affecting their lives except for the profitability behind it. And of course, the second home is whatever, for whatever reason, maybe it's a vacation home. You know, you, you might let go of a vacation home because you, you just, you're just tired of making the payments. You're like, whatever, I'm going to go ahead and default and I'm not going to make any more payments. But you're not homeless after that. But if you default on a primary, you're homeless. So there's more skin in the game on a primary versus a or not or occupied home. That's why there's a higher risk. So that's why they ask for 10% down, 20% down. And I think that's why they're trying to curb the investors borrowing money to buy non-owner occupied homes because there's a higher risk involved. Right. But again, that's all theory. That's all conjecture. That's all me kind of making guesses based on my experience. Okay. Does that make sense, Bruce? So so addressing addressing the second part, last part of that question. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, so the, it looks like uh, investors are going to be discouraged based on the uh, what you just uh, talked about. Well, 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 first time home buyers come back in. Uh, uh, what are the projected interest rates as you see it, and and how will that affect first time home buyers or any owner occupied buyer? That, that should discourage them, right? So again, uh, the interest rates going up as they, as they are projected to go up? Well, the interest rates going up is not a, is not a, 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 a institutionalized correction of trying to f- fix things. It's a reaction to everything that's going on, right? It's a reaction to the uncertainties like coronavirus. Like I, I read and I heard many times the reason why the rates j- shot up in January was because of Omicron. Right, that's the reason why, right? Uh, or that so was what, part- what's the relationship? Uh, you know, why, why would they go up because of the coronavirus? Because of uncertainty, we don't know if we're going to be locked down again. We don't know if businesses are going to have to stop opening up again. We don't know if we have to quarantine hardcore like we did when we first started. It creates a, an element of holy crap, what's going to happen? Right. So rates shoot up. It's it's a greater the coronavirus presents a greater risk to the lender uh, because um, uh, the, because of job uncertainty due to the virus. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's and more greater than the t- risk. The greater the interest rate. Well, it, it, it's whatever the impact is, right? Whether it's uh, you know less jobs or less people working or less businesses being able to stay open. Um, or uh, you know a, a, a huge shift to resources going to medical emergencies, right? Uh, medical disasters, right? I mean, who knows, right? But they're just saying that it created. A, a, we thought we we're we we're controlling a little bit, managing coronavirus. We thought we were, and then Omicron hit. Is like, wait a minute, things are worse now because Omicron is faster. It's spreading faster than any other strain that we've ever seen. So now we're even more scared, right? Um, but that is that is not something that me as a loan officer can answer because I'm I'm just telling you what I was told why rates go up. I can't explain why rates would go up because of that. You see what I'm saying? That's super genius experts are trying to figure that out. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you what I was told and what I read, why rates went up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but that's just my again, my guess, my conjecture, whatever, right? Um but uh the the rates went up because of that. And then the rates also went up again. Uh, when I say went up again, I'm talking about like they, they, they shot up and then they're going up and then they shot up again was because of the the Ukrainian thing, right? Russia invading U- Ukraine and, you know, the thoughts, the talks of World War Three, and, you know, uh, uh, cutting cutting Russia off, you know, so, you know, our, our, our access to oil is different or, or whatever, right? I mean, there's so many different factors that are affecting the economy and future stability. That's, uh, you know, because of that, I mean, no one knows what to do. Right. So there's, there's a lot of fear, I would say. Right. Uh, so the point is, I don't think that this correction or whatever you want to call it, right. Whatever the FA FHFA is doing, I don't think it's going to make a big enough impact to, bet on the fact that first time home buyers are going to come in right because again rates are still creeping up the demand i mean the demand for houses is a lot higher than the supply right rates 
I don't think it will fix that automatically. You know what I'm saying? Investors not borrowing, I don't think that's going to fix that automatically. Like I said earlier, I think this is actually will fuel or encourage cash buyers more, right? Like a lot of investors are going to be like, well, wait a minute. They're making it harder for people to borrow, to invest. Maybe we should go ahead and just buy up the houses ourselves using cash. Maybe we should, you know, transfer some of our capital resources to liquid so that we can go ahead and just buy these houses. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, these investors wanted to buy, but they can't because the prices have increased. So let's go ahead and, you know, take advantage of that opportunity, right? So the amount of houses being bought might not change. The way it's being bought changed, cash versus borrowing, borrowing versus cash, but the amount of houses might not change, right? So it's really hard for me to answer that question. Will it increase for some home buyers coming back in? From my perspective, if you need to move, you need to move. So they're going to move regardless. I mean, we were closing houses in the fives when I first started in the mortgage business. Well, about a year after I started the mortgage business. So people were buying houses at 5% interest rates. So interest rates don't have a uh, bearing on for some people because the necessity to move. I mean, I, I just locked the interest rate for borrowers who were quoted at 4.875 and now they're at 5.875. Actually, 5.75, some almost a whole point above. When they originally started, they started earlier. They started in 2021, and they finally got everything together. So they're locking right now, but they locked at a whole point higher. I mean, that's crazy, but they had no choice because they need to close their loan. You know what I'm saying? So I think first-time home buyers in general, if they can qualify, they just need to move or they want to move, and the rates are going to be whatever. It is what it is at that point, right? Uh, it sucks that they didn't move in 2020 and 2021, but for whatever reason, they didn't have to at that point. But now they have to, and they have no choice but to take the rates, whatever whatever is available. The problem is, is there inventory? Is there opportunity for them to make that, that move, right? So rates will slow down purchasing in general, I believe, it has for sure in terms of applications that I'm getting. It has for sure in terms of the amount of contracts I'm getting per application, right? There's there's a lot more work. There's a lot more pre-approvals that we had to create. You know, before we create one, two pre-approvals and we got a contract. Now we're creating 10 pre-approvals, right? So it, it, it's a lot more work now in order to buy a house, okay? Uh, so maybe the race will, you know, fix things. I don't know. Right. Uh, again, that's, I think, super geniuses who get paid millions of dollars to figure that out. They probably wouldn't be able to give you a good answer either. Right. Otherwise, they would be billionaires. Right. So, yeah, uh, hard for me to give you that answer. But um, yes, investors are being affected for sure by the rates, but also by the, again, the policies that are being enacted by FHFA or whatever. Okay. All right, cool. So, next question, or not next question, next part was, uh, and this is what I promised, is how to get an accurate rate quote, okay? And I'm going to sit down for this. I'm actually sitting on my knees right now. I'm going to sit down for this, okay? And the reason why I do that is because I'm short, right? So, I I try to make it so that you don't just see my head and my, you know, looks like my head got cut off, whatever. But I'm going to sit down comfortably, because this is this is gonna is gonna get a little involved, okay? So, and I want whoever's watching, whether you're watching replay or watching live, I want you to just kind of hear me out. The only way to get an accurate rate quote is to be ready to lock right now. It's the only way. Okay, let me repeat that. The only way to get an accurate rate quote is to be ready to lock right away. So if you don't have a contract, you're not getting an accurate rate quote, period. I know this through experience, okay? People who ask for a rate quote when they first applied and people who ask for a rate quote whenever they got a contract is two totally different numbers now, <laughs> okay? Like, until you have an address, you're not gonna get an accurate rate quote, period. That's why if you're refinancing, you can actually get an accurate rate quote at that moment. 
You see what I'm saying? Because you have a contract there. You can plug in all the details that re- that are required involved in, including a contract or not a contract, a, a, a property address, right? You can have all the ingredients you need to get an accurate rate quote and you can get an accurate, accurate rate quote. If you are refinancing, if you're purchasing and you don't have a contract, whatever I tell you today, you might as well throw out the window because it's going to be different by the time you get a contract. Okay. Unless it's timed perfectly where you ask for the rate quote today, tomorrow you get a contract and I'm able to lock you and the rates didn't change enough for it to make a difference. That would be like the only scenario where you might get somewhat of an accurate rate quote. But for the most part, you can't not, you cannot get an accurate rate quote until you're ready to lock at that moment. Okay. So what I'm telling you, the question when someone calls me out of the blue, maybe they are from Google or maybe they're referred to me by a real estate agent or maybe they're a friend. Hey, Larry, so what are the rates looking like right now? Well, what I'm going to tell you is going to be bullshit anyway, so I don't even know why I'm going to answer the question, but here's what it is today based on today's numbers. And if you were to have a house right now, that's what it is today. But in reality, I don't know why I'm telling you this because you're going to get pissed off 30 days later when you actually have a contract because it's going to be totally different. Or you might be pleasantly surprised. More than likely, you're going to be pissed off. (laughs) So I don't know why I'm answering this question. You need to focus on getting your house first, and then I can give you the truth. Otherwise, again, they're all lies. Okay, And they're not just lies because the numbers are going to change. They're lies because people are trained to lie to you. Okay, let me repeat that. People are trained to lie to you. Okay, I'm not throwing anyone in the bus. I'm not going to name any companies. I'm going to name. I'm not going to name any loan office, whatever. But the way they are, they're trained to sell you. They're trained to. They're trying. They're trained to close you, right? So if you're going to ask me what the rate is, I'm going to give you my best because I want you to call me back. I actually want to make the rate so low that every single person you ask after me is like, "Oh, dude, that's a low rate. I can't beat that." Right. And then you end up coming back to me. And then, oh, lo and behold, when it's time to lock, my rate actually went up higher than what you got called other people. But hey, you can't hold that against me because it's been 24 hours and the rates have changed. You see what I'm saying? Do you see the flaw behind that line of thinking? To ask? That's why when I talk about this class, I always laugh and roll my eyes at this question because it is a stupid question. Period. What is today's instant rate? That's a stupid question. Unless you're ready to lock right now, you have a property, whether it's your property that you're trying to refinance or you have a contract, I can't give you an accurate answer. Right? And if the rate ends up being the same the next day or a week later, we just got lucky (laughs) that they're the same. But they're not the same rate. (laughs) You know, we got lucky that they're the same, but they're not the same rate. They changed. Right? They just happened to lay in the same spot. Okay? (sighs) So... Again, I want to emphasize when someone asks, what is the interest rate? Unless you're ready to lock at that moment, you're not going to get a true answer. You're not going to get an accurate answer. So there's really no point in asking the question, right? I guess the reason why people ask this question is they want to shop you. They want to compare you to other lenders. It's not the way of doing it. And I have another class, number 10, and I'm going to show you what number 10 is, okay? Number 10 is, how do I get the best interest rate? And I will address that, okay? How to get the best interest rate, right? And that's the next class. But I'm telling you right now, how to get, how what is the best interest rate today is a dumb question. And the only way to get a true answer is to have a property you're ready to lock on, okay? Otherwise, you're asking to be lied to. You're asking for advertisement, Right? Because any loan officer that's desperate to close you on a deal is going to give you the lowest rate they can possibly give you that's legal, right? They can't tell you it's 0%. Obviously, that's wrong. That's a lie. But if their rates are anywhere between 3 and 5, they're going to tell you 3, even though you you might actually be a 5. Why? Because they don't want you going to other lenders and telling them, oh, well, this guy's telling me he's a five. Oh, well, I'm at a four. Well, then that person already lost you. <laughs> Just make, make some math. They already lost you, right? I mean, if you really think about it, if you ask me what the rates are, I tell you it's five because I'm being honest with you, right? And you talk to lender B and they tell you the rates are threes, 
I'm no longer part of the equation. You've forgotten about me. <laughs> right? I'm not calling Larry the mortgage guy ever again because his wage was like 2% higher than this other guy. I'm going to go with this other guy. Right? And what will potentially happen is if things go normal, I mean, sometimes they might get lucky. <laughs> but what will potentially happen is you're going to go and get a contract. You're going to have this lender work for you, whatever. You're going to get a contract. You give it to them. And the rate's going to be nowhere near what they quoted you. And you're like, hey, you told me the rates were in the threes, and you and he's gonna be like, oh, well, I didn't have your, I didn't have your application yet. I didn't know what your credit scores were. The rates have changed, so you're really in the four and a half, and you're gonna feel like I got screwed over. But you're gonna be like, well, I'm already invested in this guy. I've already given my credit information to him. He already has my social security number. I've already given him documents. I'm just gonna stick with him, even though he lied to you in the beginning. <laughs> Right, he lied to you in the beginning, and he, he sold you, he tricked you into going with him. And when I say I'm talking about him and her, him or her, okay, I'm just thinking about a guy, right? But him or her, right? And you're gonna stick with him because you've already you've already gone through the whole process. You don't want to start over. You see, what I'm saying. So you gotta you gotta be careful when you ask this question because you will get lied to if you ask enough lenders. You'll get lied to. And they, they're not held liable because the rates do change every single day. And there's no application. There's no, I mean, if you apply and I have your 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 credit scores, then I'm a little bit more liable, right? I can't tell you you're the threes if you're actually in the fives because your credit score sucks, right? That would definitely be unethical and maybe even illegal, right? But if you're just some random dude calling me on the phone, I don't even know your name. I can tell you whatever I want. It doesn't matter as long as it's reasonable, Right. So it's a dangerous game to play to shop lenders based on just that question alone, because you're going to have a lend. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I I have a question with regards to exactly what you're talking about. Uh, Let me first ask the question. How long does it take for a mortgage uh, uh, officer to pre-approve a buyer? So the question that Bruce asked was, how long does it take for a mortgage lender to pre-approve a buyer? It can be an hour, depending. Okay, so after an hour's conversation, and and let's suppose that the the buyer presents the documents that are necessary for pre-approval, I'm under the impression that the pre-approval letter from the mortgage lender will uh, talk about uh, what price home they'd be qualified to buy with how much money down, and um, and how much the loan amount would be. Based on that, a loan officer can't put a, a, a more firm interest rate. And then, well, of course, the question is, you know, is, an, is a mortgage officer's word, I mean, granted, you don't have a contract because you haven't purchased, you haven't, well, look at they're going to make it, uh, the, the buyer is going to make an offer on the home, let's say. And uh, you mean that mean a buy a, a mortgage officer's word is not reliable when he mm. says, "Well, based on this pre-approval, this would be the interest rate." Nope. In other words, that you're, you're basically saying that the mortgage officer has to be bound by a contract, a formal contract, in order to uh, in order to be honest about the the interest rate. Yeah, you can't lock a rate. Right? You can't lock a rate without an address. Period. When, when you say lock a rate, who's lock, who's locking the rate? The lender locks the rate for the borrower. The, the underwriter, you mean the, that that lender? No, 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 me, me. I'm the the loan officer. I can lock the rate. Yeah, I cannot. And, and, what, and typically, how long is the duration of the lock? Uh, forty five days, thirty days, fifteen days depends. Days. Yeah, I, I lock it forty five days because it gives me extra time. But if it's if it's a quick close, or let's say we're already in the process and we are had the appraisal and we were closing like in ten days, I'll lock a fifteen day lock yeah. or thirty day understand. lock. Here's what's difficult for me to, to get my head around, and that is why a mortgage broker can't give a verbal lock. Um, no, you that, know, that, I mean, that, you don't no. need a formal contract to to be an uh, an honorable person and and uh, stand behind what you're saying is the 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 interest rate. That's not a lock. Based on there, all the information. No, there's no there's no such thing as a verbal lock. There's no such thing. A lock a lock is an official commitment. It's an official commitment by the borrower to stick to the rates that is being told to them. 
that, yeah, so much business, so much business is not done by contract. It's done by a handshake. Uh, well, I, and, and you know, I, I have, you I have nothing a buyer to can't shake hands with a mortgage no. officer and rely on, on the interest rate. No. He's no. quoted based on all the documentation the buyer has submitted and based on the pre-approval. Nope. That's, that's what, that's why it's a lock. A lock is a, a, a hardcore promise. This is the, the price that you're going to get, period. No matter what happens for the next 30 days. That's what a lock is. There's no, there, there's no gray area. It's either you're locked or unlocked, period. There's no other discussion behind that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's how I, it works. Okay. I, I'm that's, just having a hard time understanding why, um, you, you can't trust a mortgage, <laughs> a mortgage agent's word. It, it, it's not, it's if not. He it's, wanted to give it. And, and it, why would he want, why would he not want to give a verbal lock? No, because there's no such thing. But why wouldn't he? No, no such thing. Yeah, yeah, there is such a thing. The, no, there's no, a, no, a mortgage, no, no. Well, a mortgage agent can give a verbal commitment. Why would he not want to honor that? Why, no, is, he, why is he, he requiring a formal document? No, he, it's, it's an address. It's an address, right? So if, if a loan officer wants to play cavalier, right, he can lock a rate without getting a contract if he has an address. But that's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to get a contract first, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I it's, guess, it's I, just, guess I don't understand why he needs the address. Like, that, I'm, that, not, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just curious. I'm trying to get my head around everything. That, that, that's, that's just a requirement. No, that's required by Fannie and Freddie. There needs to be an address. Uh, an application is not a full application without an address. There's six things that you need uh, in order to have a full application. An address is one of the six. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a law. So if you're asking why, ask the law lawmakers. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> is it, okay, last question. Does the mortgage... Does a mortgage broker have more information from which he can give a lock-in interest rate once, other than the address of the house that's being purchased? Is there additional information that, that he has at the time there's a formal contract? I mean, you, uh, that, you, that allows him to, to the lock in the interest rate. The, the way the way a lock works, um, and this might help you a little bit, Bruce, is is based on the data that you input into the application. Okay, so there's all sorts of questions that they ask, and there's all sorts of inputs, and then there's a credit report, right? There's all sorts of variables that affect the 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 rate quote. Okay, without an address, you can't lock it. I've been, we've been talking about this, right? If I press lock and there's no address, it's going to be like there's no address, provided address before locking. It doesn't allow you to do it. The system is built that way, okay? So whatever information I put in there is what the lock is going to happen. Now, the reason why this is a good question you're asking, Bruce, is let's say they're buying a $400,000 house and they told me over the phone they're going to put 5% down. Right. But then after they got the contract, the contract says they're putting 10% now. Maybe they negotiated that. Who knows? So I asked the borrower, hey, Mr. Borrower, you told me you're going to put 5% down. That's what it says on the application. But it says on the contract you're putting 10% down. Yeah, we decided we want to put 10% down. Well, that's a change of information. Right. I was locking them at 5%, but they put 10% down. That changes the lock. That will right. actually, okay. actually, it actually, no. the interest rate. So that it, change, it, it changes the pricing. Yeah. Yes. The lock is still there, but it changes the interest rate. So the way the lock works, and this is a really deep, deep question. And I, I never thought I would get this deep with it about with anyone. Right. But a lock basically freezes the pricing across the board, whether you're going to go with a 5% interest rate, whether you buy it down to 4.5, whether you buy it to a four, the pricing is frozen. Right. So let's say a five is par, meaning it costs nothing. A four and a half costs you a thousand and a four costs you two thousand. You lock at a five at par. Well, let's say you decide to buy it down to four and a half next week. Well, the price is a thousand. It's still, it's still the same. So it's still the same lock, but you're changing the lock uh, 
the 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 rate which charges you an extra thousand dollars but now you're only paying a four and a half instead of a five you see what i'm saying but the lock locks everything that's that day you see what i'm saying so the way you have to kind of look at it is that you're actually locking the price for 10 different rates five and a half depending upon how much five. you're buying it down exactly so that's yeah. what the lock really is the lock also applies to the the amount of the details involved like the amount that you're putting down right or let's say you decide to waive escrows well, you can only do that in conventional loan but let's say you decide you decide i don't want to escrow my tax measures i'm going to pay that up front so please waive my escrows that can change the pricing because it's a change of circumstance right because waiving escrows is a risk right people who don't want to do escrow like they are not forced to being pay they're not forced to pay their taxes and insurance on a monthly basis but they're going to do it on their own we don't control that so that's a risk so of course it's going to increase the pricing a little bit it doesn't increase the rate it's just an adjustment that they add to it right but that changes things so the lock keeps it the same and whatever you decide to pick it's just whatever that pricing is you see what i'm saying yeah. so so, so the, if there's any parameters that change after the law mm -hmm. there's pretty much a rigid formula by how the interest yes. rate is going to change so yeah okay i got you, I got you. Sure. but if you change the address that kills everything <laughs> <laughs> you change the ad <laughs> you, well it, it's it's be, it's because that's part of the application like the six the, like the six and i don't remember all of them i might be able to name on top of my head but it's name uh phone number email address um birth date and social security number or actually might not be birthday whatever it is address is one of the one of the the sixes i think it's six pieces you need yeah so it's just it's every loan is dependent on the address so like if i have a loan one with address a and loan uh loan two with address a there's gonna be a huge problem like why do you have two applications with the same same address that's not possible you have everything else the same but if you have different ad addresses we're good you have same address wait a minute red flag why do we have two loans for the same address they're really really sticklers about that so yeah it's it's important just like i can't lock a loan without a social security number you know what i'm saying i can't uh, there's no credit pool there's no nothing we don't have enough data to know what to to quote them but the address is part of them it's just a requirement uh so yeah there's no verbal lock <laughs> and over a lock is a literal commitment that you're purchasing the loan at this amount and you're stuck with it why do people lock people lock for two reasons number one uh so that they can know for sure what they're getting so there's no more question beyond it but they also lock because they don't want the rates to go up when they could have got locked in a lower rate that's why it, there's a timeline behind it you can lock this rate for 15 days you can lock this rate for 30 days you lock this rate for, for, for 45 days that's why people lock the reason why people wouldn't want to lock we call it floating is if they perceive that the rates will go down right because you're stuck Right. If I lock the rate at four at, at five at par, meaning zero, and the rates go down to three and a half, well, actually half a point might make a difference. But if the lock goes down, let's say a quarter, you can't do anything about it. I'm sorry, sir. Unfortunately, today you're 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 paying more than you would have if you would have locked tomorrow. You see what I'm saying? It's just how things work. Right. And that's an, an accurate quote, but I was just kind of giving you an idea. Today and tomorrow is gonna to be different, right? But if you and lock them today. If, if the rates do go down after the lock and the contract. Uh, oh, wait a minute. When, when, when you say contract, is, is that, in other words, the, the buyer is bound to get take the mortgage from that particular mm -mm. lender who, mm -mm. who locked in the rate? I'm talking if, about. If not, then if the rates go down after the lock, just resubmit another application to take advantage of the lower interest rate. No? Not with the same lender. Oh, okay. Yeah, and see, you're kind of alluding to how I one of the tricks I have for how to get the best interest rate, and I'll talk about that next week. But yes, that's that's a uh, aha moment that you just had. Yes, just not with the same lender. Okay. This is all, you uh, know, Larry. I got to tell you, this is all very interesting to me. It really is. <laughs> I, 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 honestly, goodness, I, I because I, I know very little about interest. Uh, excuse me, about uh, mortgages, and this is really fascinating. It really is. Yeah, and, uh, uh, I, I have to forgive me for having taken up so much time with these 
these uh, you know tangential questions. But uh, no, 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 Bruce, no, you don't I, understand. You, you, you know, you don't understand. You're helping me. Number one, I have to be able to answer these questions intelligently and confidently. If I don't, then I need to get my shit together, right? Number one, and number two, this is going to create more videos. Like I'm going to create, I'm going to make a video about this. Bruce. Okay. So you're helping me for sure. So ask away, dude. <laughs> ask away. Uh, uh, let's put it this way. Common sense is not always applicable in the mortgage business, right? Uh, maybe not even the real estate business, but for sure in the mortgage business, there's a lot of like, why? Why this? Why that? I get a lot of that from my clients. Why are you asking me for this? Why are you asking me for that? It's like their common sense tells them that they're, I'm asking for something they don't need to give me. But the truth of the matter is, Nine times out of 10, okay? And this might help uh, ease your stress a little bit and, and ease your curiosity. Nine times out of 10, the reason the reason why to the answer why is because someone else in the past screwed up and broke the law and now they have to fix it by creating this particular uh, requirement, right? So you might be asking, why do we not do nonverbal law? I mean, why can't we do uh, verbal locks? Because maybe 10 years ago they did and people abused the crap out of it and it became an issue. That might be the reason why. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. So, so, so from my perspective, and I know this for a fact, because I, when I took the test, <laughs> when I took the test, there was a lot of scenarios where they were demonstrating a loan officer doing really unethical, illegal things. And they're asking us, how do we handle it? And I know the way, why they asked that question is because people actually did it. <laughs> loan officers actually did the scenario that they're showing me and they're trying to find out how I would react to that. Like, what would you do in this situation, Larry? And I'm like, someone must have done this. <laughs> right? So, 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 so the reason why it's tougher to become a loan officer, the reason why there's uh, specific requirements now is because someone screwed up. Someone broke the law, someone abused uh, clients, someone took advantage, whatever. They did something really bad to the point where they had to create a law to protect against it. So, yeah. Uh, and, the, Actually, and that's it. You know, I'm just speculating, but you know, years ago, somebody might have given a verbal lock mm -hmm. only to be sued by the client eventually when yeah, they didn't live might... up to the verbal lock. So now it's, yeah. you know, the, the requirement is a formal contract. You know, you know what I predict? I predict there's a guy who did a lot of verbal, verbal locks or whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? And then uh, when they finally got a contract, the guy quit and went to another company. And they're like, well, the guy told us this. You know, he gives a verbal lock. It's like, well, he's gone. So his verbal lock no longer exists. It's no longer good because we don't have anything on paper. <laughs> we don't have we don't we don't have anything on paper. We have this guy, and this guy tells us that he did, he never talked to you. That's what he's telling us. He's verbally telling us he never, he never talked to you ever before. So it probably created a lot of issues. So that I'm predicting that's what happened. You know, uh, and people lost houses. People lost houses because of it, you know, because they, they thought they were going to be at a four and they end up locking at a five. And because they locked at a five, they can't afford it. And they end up like having nullified their contract and they're, they already sold their other house and all their shits in the, in the storage place. So they're suing the mortgage company. You guys told me I could be locking a 4% interest rate. Well, that's homeboy who's no longer with us. He's, he's, he's at Starbucks right now. He doesn't even work for the mortgage company anymore. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So that so so whatever he told you verbally doesn't hold water. You know what I'm saying? We need a we need an actual documented lock, which you don't have. Sorry, sir. <laughs> I bet you that's what happened. <laughs> oh man, because uh, I'm t I heard back then loan officers just said whatever they had to just to get the loan. I mean, literally, and they were not held liable at all. They can say whatever they want, and it just I mean, I heard back in the days, uh, you have a job. Okay, write down that you have a job. How much do you need to write down? Okay, you, you make this much? Okay, cool, you're approved. Here, here's a pre-approval letter. Go get a house. That's literally what I heard, how it worked. <laughs> like, like if you have a job and you told and you told us how much your income, it's stated income, right? You tell us how much you make, we'll take your word for it, and you, hey, you qualify. Go buy a $300,000 house because you make more than enough based on what you just told me. Not, not what you showed me, not your documentation, not your pay stubs, not a verification of employment for your boss. You told me you make this much, so I believe you. So go ahead and go get a house now. Approved. Click. <laughs> I mean, that's what happened back in the days, right? So it's happening now, Larry. I uh, I, I contacted a, a mortgage broker who wrote a pre-approval letter for uh, my, one of buy, a buyer I had, and I said, and, and it said that there was no documentation. And you know, I don't know. It was like a cursory check of the, of 
virtually no documents, right? And you know, I called the broker up, or excuse me, the mortgage guy up, and and I said, this is not a pre-approval letter. This is a pre-qualification letter in New Jersey. You know, mm -hmm. we, we don't call this a pre-approval letter. And I said, it's not going to hold any weight if I submit an offer with this with this pre-qualification letter. You know, it doesn't hold any weight. You haven't checked into the, the, the documentation. It says it right here in your so-called pre-approval letter. Um, I, I, I don't know if that mortgage company is still uh, issuing pre-approval letters of that sort. But, uh, but at any rate, you know, they're still doing it today. Oh, that's funny. That's real funny. Um, so I, now I want to get to the actual like granular tactic on how to get an accurate rate quote. Okay. You have to apply. Sorry. I'm sorry, but you have to apply. You can't get it over the phone and not give your information. You're not going to get an accurate rate quote. Okay. I mean, the only thing I know about you is who you told me you are and what your phone number is and your number might be blocked. So I can tell you whatever I want. It doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? And you can't hold it against me because rates change every single day. So only way to get an accurate rate quote is you have to actually commit and apply and provide documentation and then get a contract with a property because we need the address. Like Bruce and I have basically, like he said, we beat a dead horse, right? We need the address, right? So you're refinancing. Obviously, the address is the home that you're refinancing, right? So you have to have an address and then you have to get a locked Loan estimate, locked, okay, locked. Because I can give you a loan estimate all day long that's not locked, and it's it's just, it can change any second, right? So when I ask someone for a locked loan estimate, and they get a loan estimate, and it says floating, not locked, that's not an accurate rate quote. That was accurate the moment it was printed. Actually, it might not even be accurate anymore, because sometimes what you quote, it changed by the time it went from the loan officer quoting you to the disclosure desk who's sending out the disclosures. I mean, four hours makes a difference. You see what I'm saying? Or for sure, a day makes a difference. So if I quoted you on Thursday and the disclosure sent out on Friday, that number might be completely wrong now. It actually happened to me, right? Where the rate was a certain number on Wednesday and Thursday, it changed. And we none of us knew about it. None of us saw it happening. Okay. So again, if it's not locked, that's not an accurate rate quote. Sure, you might get lucky and lock the rate and it's the same exact number, but that's because it just happened to be that way. But it's not the same rate because it's a different day. Okay? It's not the same rate. It just happens to be the same number, right? But you have a 50-50 chance for sure that the rate will change the moment you get a rate quote on a loan estimate and the moment you decide to lock it, unless you lock it the moment you saw the loan estimate. Let's say I send you the loan estimate which is an official disclosure. It's part of your initial disclosure. It's official, right? It's compliant, right? I send it to you. You look at it, it's like, the rates of four. I'm like, yeah, can we lock it right now? And I look at it, I'm like, yes, we can lock it right now. Then you lock it. Yes, that will become an accurate rate quote. But that's because you locked it the moment you saw it and you got lucky that the rate didn't change. But an actual rate quote that's, that's accurate has to be a locked loan estimate. Okay, and uh, I, I should have done a screenshot to show you the difference between locked and floating. So you can see it's it's just a difference of check marks. There's a box over here that says locked, and there's a box over here that says unlocked or not locked. It has to be locked, otherwise it's not accurate. So people do it to me all the time. They're like, I got a guy quote me three percent interest rate. I'm like, let me see it. I need I need a locked loan estimate, a locked loan estimate. They send me a loan estimate. It's not locked. I'm like, this is nothing. They're like, what do you mean? It's like it's not locked. So he told you a three, but it might be a four in reality, but he hasn't locked it yet. So you have to get a lock loan estimate, a commitment for me to actually have, for me to actually take this number as truth. Right now, this is an advertisement. Like, what do you mean? It's like, he, he doesn't have to honor that. It's 3%, but unlocked. So that's an advertisement. There's no commitment there. He doesn't have to honor that. He can turn around and change it to tomorrow if, he, if, 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 if the rates change. And he would have to because the rates change. So... You need, it to be, you need it to be locked. The moment they send me a lock loan estimate, the check mark's locked. Okay, for 45 days, this is your rate. You're 100% accurate. That is truth. That is reality. They have to commit to that. If you lock with this, if you lock and complete your loan with this company within 45 days, that's the rate you're getting. That's the accurate rate code. Okay, and that's the bottom line. That's what this class is about. How to get an accurate rate code, that is the only way. Okay.
if you want an accurate rate quote, if you just want quotes, then we can all give you quotes. You can go online. You can, you can, you can go on the internet. What are the interest rates? You'll get quotes if you want quotes, <laughs> right? But if you want an accurate rate quote, that's the only way to do it, okay? And Bruce and I kind of talked about it, but I'm going to show you how to get an accurate rate quote because I know why you're asking about the rates. You want to know if you're getting screwed or you want to know if you can afford it or if you want or you want to know if you're getting the best deal. I must tell you next week, on how to take what I just showed you and use that to get the best rates possible. Okay. That's me next week. So, uh, any questions other than that? I think that's the end of the class. There's nothing more yet. Cause the next, cl next class is the next slide is the class I'm going to teach next week. But yeah, any other questions about that? Anybody? Oh, there's a attendee here. Hold on, Bob. Let me add you to the call, Bob. Sorry about that. And for some reason, I didn't hear you come in. Do you have a question or anything <clears throat> to ask or contribute to what we just discussed, Bob? No, I'm just listening in. Okay, cool. Hey, I, I'm glad you're on the call, Bob. I mean, you know, of course, you and I have known each other for years, and uh, and you know, we've interacted, and engaged with each other. Uh, how, if you don't mind me asking, how long of the call did you watch? Did you watch like five minutes or you've been here for like a long time? I'm asking you, Bob, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> well, I, think I, I thought I unmuted him. Well, he, he muted himself. Oh, okay. He might have just disappeared. He might be like, yeah, I'm here, Larry, and then he just walked off. <laughs> no, no, I'm here. Okay, cool. So, so how long? Uh, if you don't mind me it asking, was the how same long? Thing, trying to make me a panelist, and I didn't know what that meant, but I hit go ahead, and then it like disconnected and reconnected. Okay, okay, cool. So, so the question I asked you was, uh, if you don't mind me asking, how long have you been on the call? Uh, only about ten minutes. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so, so, uh, what's your opinion? Like, and when I say what's your opinion, what's your opinion on the information, what's your opinion on me? Because the reason I'm asking Bruce is because, like I said, Bob and I have known each other. And the first time we met each other, we were on a similar call where we got together and we had like a Zoom discussion. And I just want to know, like, uh, you know, since since it's been a while since we engaged, you know, what's his opinion with like my style of delivery and what I'm talking about? No, I think it's right. Well, I appreciate you, that. You really, you really put, you really take a lot of time to put yourself out there for people so i appreciate that yes that's that's the purpose right Bob? like i think that uh people for the most part are mystified by the buying process right and i mean if you really think about it, it's not that complicated it's complicated but it's not like rocket science i, mean, I don't know what rocket science looks like but if yeah. i can learn it if i can learn it i think anyone can learn it right even mm -hmm. if you're not a professional you know, so my my goal is just to translate. That's why I call myself the, the mortgage insider. My goal is to be your spy. I'm going to take the information. I'm going to give it to you. I'm your spy. Right. You want to know about interest rate? Here, let me tell you about interest rate. You want to know how to get the best interest rate? Let me tell you how to get the best interest rate. You want to know what what you know, uh, what's happening with investors and, and how they're getting fees and they're getting paid. They're getting charged here. I'm going to give you that information right now. You know, Bruce asked, how do, I, how do I tell clients on what to expect in terms of their payments depending on the rate? Oh, here you go. I'm going to give it to you. You see what I'm saying? That's my goal. I think, again, people, they're mystified. They're confused. They're, they're, they're just operating blindly. And I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that's required. I think you can actually go through the buying process fully informed and fully educated enough to make this a very fun and easy process. But most people don't because loan officers in general suck at providing information and, and education about the process. And therefore it becomes an, un, it becomes a non enjoyable process. It becomes a process that people hate. It becomes a process that people complain about all the time. I get calls every single day from clients who just want to complain. I can't believe they're asking me for this. I can't believe they asked me for that. There's why do you need this? Why do you need that? It's because they're they're just uninformed and they and they 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 don't respect it, right? They don't see. I mean, we're giving them two, three, four, or five hundred thousand dollars. It's not really that much to ask, but I think because people aren't prepared mentally, they they look at it as like a huge deal. Because I mean, we are asking for a bunch of favors. Hey, can you provide me your 
your tax returns. Hey, uh, I know you probably don't think about this, but I need your W-2s. Hey, I need your bank statements. No, I need all pages. You only give me one. I need all five. You know, we, we are asking favors, but we're also giving you two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> right? So, I think with a uh, with with transparency, with promotion of the information, with education, we can be more prepared. I think people will be less shocked when they go through it. Sorry, I thought someone said something. All right, cool. So let's see here. I want to see if I am done. I think I might be. What is this? I don't even know what this part is. Oh, that's this. Uh, that's the last part of my class. Okay, uh, my last class. All right, cool. Any other questions or any uh, takeaways or ahas that you guys want to share before we end this call? I think we, we covered a lot, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure Bruce agrees. He's been here for like an hour or longer, two hours almost, I think. I think he agrees that we covered a lot, right, Bruce? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I learned a lot. I really did. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know. I appreciate you, sir. Seriously. I mean, I think you made this call way cooler. <laughs> like you being here has made the call. Like I'm like, yes, I, I know that I wasn't prepared, but I'm so thankful and grateful and blessed that Bruce showed up to, to basically give me shit because I had to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> I had to deliver. Uh, so, anyways, I really appreciate you guys. Uh, again, my name is Larry Lee with uh, you know the Larry Lee team eight three two six zero six two one nine three. You can email me. You can text me. Uh, I showed Bruce how to find me on YouTube. Larry Lee Lender. You'll find me on YouTube for sure. You can uh, again Google me. I make sure that you'll find me if you Google me. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Just let me know. And I really appreciate you guys being on this call. And if you found this class interesting, be sure to tune in to the next week's class where I actually tell you strategically step-by-step step, how to get the best interest rate period whether you work with me or work with any other lenders i don't care i'm gonna show you the whole reason why you're asking about interest rates i'm gonna show you how to get the best interest rate next week right so again i really appreciate you guys being on this call if you have any questions give me a call texting me email me whatever you like this is larry the mortgage guy your mortgage insider and certified veteran mortgage advisor Appreciate you guys. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. Take care. Thanks, guys. See you later.